Hello. Today we are here with the six LaRouche Democratic candidates for U.S. Congress. Uh, we've traveled from all over the country representing the six corners of the United States. And what I'd like to first start out with uh, before we start our discussion here is that Lyndon LaRouche just gave a State of the Union address which is going to be made clear that everything he said was absolutely correct when Obama makes his State of Disunion address tonight uh, discussing how, one, the United States is in a state of economic growth and progress. Is This is what Obama is putting out, that the union is sound and that there is no problems whatsoever that the nation is facing, that our eco economic status is in good condition. And as Mr. LaRouche said during his State of the Union address, Obama is a gone bunny. And anybody who is still going along with the insanity of this president and his push for fascism and austerity is out of the out of their minds. <laughs> and they are continuing to go along with the policy of insanity. And it is clearly stated that the nation will not survive this crisis. As Mr. LaRouche made clear, we are in the midst of a global financial collapse, a hyperinflationary collapse that is international. And the solutions that have been put on the table are clear. Democrats that are still going along with the insanity that we can wait a little longer for this president to be removed have to come to terms with the fact that Obama represents a policy of fascism and must go now. And the only solution to saving the nation and the world from this economic global financial collapse is to remove Obama with the 25th Amendment and to immediately restore the principles of our republic and our U.S. Constitution, a Glass-Steagall banking reorganization, and a credit system modeled on the principles of our U.S. Constitution and that of the founding Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton. And so these are the ideas that we would like to outline today in our discussion, and the panelists are Diane Sayer, here from New Jersey, and we have Bill Roberts, representing Michigan, we also, and Detroit. We have Rachel Brown, representing Massachusetts, home of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. <laughs> and we have, we, we have our friend here, Dave Christie, who is representing Washington State, and Summer Shields, who will be representing the congressional, uh, representing San Francisco Bay Area. Now, before we get too far, I just want to say that the Democratic Party could learn a great lesson from Keisha. Uh, that Keisha actually, for people who don't know this, won the Democratic Party primary in the year 2010. She was in a three-way race, and her platform was impeach Obama, save NASA. And uh, the top endorsed, funded Democrat was running around saying, uh, I'm the Democrat who doesn't want to impeach Obama. He got 27 percent of the vote. Keisha won a three-way race with 53 percent of the vote and then went on in the general election to get 62,000 votes, about 30 percent, in a hardcore Republican district. So uh, part of what we're doing, and you'll hear from all of us, is that uh, our candidacies, our slate, will teach the Democratic Party how to fight. Absolutely. And this is what we need, people that have uh, the guts and the courage to stand up, as all of our candidacies represent, to promote and provide the solutions which are needed to get out of this collapse. Because if you look at the situation today, we don't have a president. And what Mr. LaRouche laid on the table uh, in his State of the Union address just this past Saturday were the clear solutions for what a real president represents. And because Obama does not represent that, and you look at what's going on, the fact that he will be given a State of the Union address, and he's saying that a hyperinflationary bubble is, it's a good thing. Um, they're saying that a bubble is pros <laughs> prosperity. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, you think about what does this represent in the scope of where the nation stands that our physical production is gone to shambles right now. We don't have a nation that is organized around a mission. And this is something that our candidates, 
uh, candidacies are taking up and we're taking up the challenge to address those those questions which people have to recognize are the key to understanding how our nation was developed uh, and the concepts and principles that people, as Mr. LaRouche said, who don't understand uh, in Congress, who are representing, who take an oath of office and say that they don't have to uphold that oath of office and they can choose whatever they want to in the Constitution. They can choose to defend the general welfare clause or not to defend the general welfare clause. Um, we should tell them to get out. And he said in much stronger words than that. <laughs> but for viewing purposes here. Uh, <laughs> younger audience. <laughs> um, and I think that's absolutely true. When you vow to uphold the Constitution, you are vowing to uphold those principles of the general welfare and the principles of our preamble, uh, which is the core to everything the Constitution represents. And so with that, I just open the discussion up on how we're going to defend that. Yeah, well, I'll just uh, speak first. Um, well, what, what people saw in, in my race in Massachusetts against Barney Frank was that Barney Frank uh, chose to uh, you know, misrepresent the, the idea of Glass-Steagall. And this has now been taken up as a national discussion and as an international discussion, but it really represents the point of insanity, the fact that we have not passed it as of yet. And, uh, I mean, we really are just reaching the breaking point, where day by day, you know, you need more and more money to pump into this system to keep it alive. It's like, you know, a million dollars yesterday, a billion the next, and a trillion dollars coming up soon. That's the, that's the, the rate at which our money pumping is, is being required right now. So really, only Glass-Steagall will stop that, uh, that process of hyperinflation joined with the cuts that go with it. And this has got to be brought up immediately. You know, that's why our candidacies are, are acting right now and not waiting for further down the line, is because this, this system has to be saved now. Well, the, the old system has to be put, put, you know, put to rest, and we have to go back to a, a credit system, which I know more, more people here have... Uh, you know, plenty to represent in their districts about this idea. Um, but just also what, what you brought up about the, the State of the Union today is that these economists are going to be working overtime trying to figure out how to paste these numbers together mm -hmm. to make it sound like anything is happening good. Because it's obvious to anyone in reality that this is a, a collapsing economy. There's nothing good about it. Perhaps the thing uh, more inflating faster than the money is Obama's ego. <laughs> <laughs> I would say so. I think that definitely what you were bringing up earlier with the idea of the problem with the bubble economy, where people have essentially had the sense that you can prop up a bubble in just about anything, we'll leave the bubble economy for the bubble heads. And I think that's the general policy approach. And I think that we've got the six candidates here but we're approaching a six, a six regional campaign. And we've got myself and Dave here who are definitely featuring the Western portion of that strategy. And in particular, I think a lot of what I'm going to be doing in my area of the United States in San Francisco, many people don't know the history that's there. That's, that's critical. And many people don't know the important role that Franklin Roosevelt saw in the region of San Francisco. And particularly, what many people don't know is the fact that we had the United Nations Charter was signed there. And it, unfortunately, it was signed 13 days after Franklin Roosevelt's death. So the intention of Franklin Roosevelt, what he wanted for a world community where the United States, China, and Russia, Soviet Union at the time, and then the British the British Empire, freed of its colonies and its, and its evil, would be able to essentially coexist as a series of nations that could live in a world peacefully and as sovereign nations, that, and you could engage in the kind of development process that these nations required. And so a big part of what I'll be doing, and Dave and I, but all of us really together, is going to be orienting, on the one hand, the cultural process, approaching China, approaching Russia particularly, and 
India as well, across Asia as a developmental perspective, away from the transatlantic approach, and begin the process of essentially uh, moving in the direction of real cooperation on real economic ideas and the North American Water and Power Alliance, which is the policy that all of us are going to push to make the policy of the world by this month, if, if possible, we're going to push this thing to have done, be done this month, that this policy is the opening gateway for the development of not only North America, but then also the development of the Asian community. Because as we've been discussing, once you start to have that kind of development in the Arctic region, then you're talking about development that extends across into Asia. So we're going to be focusing in on, that, on, on the approach of having a community of principle among sovereign nation states. But as a national approach, it's going to be very much a push for the North American Water and Power Alliance, NAWAPA. Right. And with that, um, I think it's important uh, with the gl global development perspective to also uh, have the listeners join us in welcoming in our internationally extended slate, uh, because we have the six of us in the United States here representing NAWAPA but on this global uh, initiate, initiative. We also have an extended slate of candidates. Um, in Berlin, we have for mayor, uh, Stefan Tolstorff, and we want to welcome him to our slate of candidates because what we represent is not just representation for the United States, but for this global development perspective and all of the other candidates that will be joining us uh, throughout the country and throughout the nation to represent these policies. Yeah, yeah and I think any sense of leadership that, that the population is going to respond to right now has to resonate that sense of optimism of an international solution. Because you've got, you know, take the area of Detroit, which is an incredibly uh, you know, productive area uh, of, of, the, of the nation, um, where people's, people's ability to actually be engaged in a process of uh, contributing to a productive society has been destroyed. And we saw this in 2005 when the when the Congress refused to uh, implement LaRouche's Economic Recovery Act to retool the, the um, empty floor space and the, the machine tool capacity within, within the greater Midwest region. And then again in 2007, when the Congress again sided with the, the swindlers and, and uh, brought on the, <clears throat> brought on the uh, foreclosure tsunami by refusing to protect the population. And then so with the... Now, with the collapse of the, the revenue base, this, you have these, these highly productive areas of the country where people have all these skills. They're being told, oh, well, actually, you're the problem. You know, you're the, you, you cost too much. Your, your liver transplant costs too much. Your uh, teachers' pensions cost too much. Your firefighters, they just cost too much money. That's, that's the problem. And, uh, and this is the... You know, this is the arsenal of democracy you have. And these people have been involved. They have a sense of their, their value. And so I think what we represent is this, this perspective. We're bringing the Glass-Steagall policy, the, the NOAPA policy, which is really, really one and the same thing. It's, it's a rejection of that idea of value being something determined by how much Wall Street wants to destroy you and rape you. <laughs> and... Uh, and so that's, that's part of, I think, what, what we're bringing into these, in, into these particular areas uh, is just a total redefinition with this idea of a credit policy of, of the value of the individual human being within the context of what the mission of the nation is. Yeah, actually, I was uh, just recalling that uh, uh, apparently uh, Hitler said the one thing that he would bomb first in... World War II was Detroit, mm -hmm. and we've bombed it ourselves. Uh, but I think that obviously the Midwest region, and uh, for those that don't know, LaRouche expanded the conception of the Midwest going from Boston to St. Louis, so uh, we've got about the upper quarter northeast of our nation now being the Midwest. But in the, in the sense of a productive capability, 
that will be radically revived. Um, over in, uh, on the west coast and specifically up in the northwest region um, where I'll be running in the, uh, against Adam Smith, um, the congressman. However, I would like to make the point again that we all are running against Adam Smith, the philosophy. Yes. Um, <laughs> British liberalism be damned. Um, <clears throat> anyway, but the northwest region with the, the development of Nawapa, uh, up till now the Northwest has been the isolated Shangri-La. Uh, you know, like even in Idaho, for example, you got all these Hollywood stars going to buy up massive tracts of the pristine land that uh, we're going to be transforming into a, uh, well, really a, a massive scientific center. Um, and one thing that's apparent is that as soon as Nawapa goes into construction, the international perspective that Summer talked about is uh, right there, especially around the Bering Straits, uh, the, the tunnel underneath the Bering Straits, uh, something that LaRouche and his wife Helga have fought for for decades. Uh, but that's where you get a whole new international perspective um, and a capability for the development of that Arctic region, Siberia, uh, and as well Alaska, Yukon, that whole area. And what I just realized is that it's not just merely the mineral wealth of this region, which is going to be absolutely crucial for the development of China and India and uh, so forth, but, but really what you get is the concept of the, the Silk Road, and not just the mineral wealth, the industrial uh, revival that Nawapa will bring, but uh, the cultural uh, renaissance potentials. And, uh, you know, I just, I was just thinking about it. Um, you know, you did have that with the Silk Road, and it's kind of funny that uh, some of the most immediately affected regions of, of the nation around Nawapa and the, the Bering Straits, which really is the land bridge concept, the world land bridge concept, you know, ultimately going to South America and so forth, but uh, it struck me that places like Alaska, uh, Idaho, eastern Washington, and sort of my uh, general region uh, are going to become new cultural centers, which is something you may, uh, people don't normally think of with a place like Alaska. Uh, it seems like the general cultural identity is uh, how to compete with looking like a grizzly bear or something. <laughs> or, uh, you know, maybe the, the term redneck in uh, eastern Washington and Idaho. Or Actually, I was just thinking of this thing with uh, Palin where, where she made the comment, you know, around this whole question of the let's have civil discourse. And she made the, co the point around civil do discourse, uh, you know, does... Is that uh, the history of our nation, would, would uh, the, the duels that have solved the, the political battles in the past, uh, would that be considered civil discourse? And, you know, of course, you think of Alexander Hamilton and Burr, but uh, I was half wondering if she may not have been referring to the uh, bar fights in uh, Alaska last year being <laughs> solved with duels. But anyway, <laughs> point being, you're going to have these regions uh, transformed culturally. Uh, if you take the case of Idaho, you know, with a with a potential density of of fission power to drive these pumping facilities, uh, you're going to have uh, a high density area, which would be necessary for the kind of scientific breakthroughs around fusion technology. And you know, if you think of the the case of Einstein and his violin that Lynn refers to, or mm -hmm. The string quartets that the the rocket scientists mm -hmm. were involved in, you know, you, you get a real sense that with this kind of culture, uh, uh, scientific development, and in, in now this region of Alaska and and uh, you know Idaho and the Northwest in general, you get a, a new capability for the cultural transformation too, which uh, struck me as as being a, an interesting process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Speaking of this uh, duel, I mean, Burr may have killed Hamilton, but Hamilton won uh, because we established our Constitution. And I think uh, as a candidate from New Jersey, where Hamilton set up the Society for Useful Manufacturers, one thing we can really do is use the lesson of Hamilton with the American population, because you do have all these people, including 
one knucklehead in my state who wants to reinterpret the Constitution without the General Welfare Clause. And one thing that a lot of people don't know is one of the first things that Hamilton did is he said the federal government is going to assume the debt of all the states. And this was a controversial point in his day because some states didn't have much debt and some had a lot of debt. But he knew that that was the only way to pull the country together and that, as LaRouche said in his webcast, debt is not in itself a bad thing. Good debt, legitimate debt, which is based on a future product, a future, you know, whatever it is, a nuclear power plant, a WAP, et cetera, is a good debt. Uh, what they're doing with these bailouts is just genocide. The policy is genocide. So we can, um, we can use that. And I was, I've been looking a little bit more into the history of New Jersey, which is really fascinating because I think the first railroad charter was connecting two of the river systems in 1815 in New Jersey. And Patterson, which was the city that Hamilton started, was a huge producer of locomotives. Mm -hmm. And the, con the idea was that this area was going to move west and that there would be transportation corridors out throughout the rest of the country. And just as an exercise, some of us here um, the other night, because New Jersey happens to be the most densely populated state in the United States with a little mm. over a thousand people per square mile. Mm. So we did an extrapolation and found that if the United States had the same population density as New Jersey, and just for the record, we do have farms. <laughs> <laughs> we do have parks and forests Some and elbow room. yeah exactly um, the United States right now could have over four billion people hmm. so that 's something to bear in mind when we 're dealing with these crazy environmentalists mm -hmm. who tell us the world is overpopulated and think small and kill off your children to balance the budget right. actually, we should be someplace else yeah and I think that's important uh, what you bring up from the standpoint of really educating people on this principle of a credit system because it is a principle and uh, just as Glass-Steagall and they go hand in hand together and what Dave just so uh, profoundly laid out on the WAPA all of these are sort of a uh, unified force and they act in, in accord with one another and I think you know it's interesting that most of us sitting here are representing states which have some of the largest budget deficits out there. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, California, to say the least. Um, and what's being proposed for these states to push a policy of having to push austerity against your population, to kill the population, to deny them the basic uh, standards of, of living, is mm -hmm. insane. Because we have trillions of dollars out there bailing out Goldman Sachs and everyone else that you can name, an international financial interest that is completely bankrupt. But we say you have to go and eat your babies. I mean, this is just completely, completely insane. And so, you know, our candidacies are really taking this fight to the streets. Um, and we're telling people, these state legislators and representatives, that you don't have the right. And I think Mr. LaRouche laid this out really clearly recently uh, when he said, just as someone doesn't have the right uh, to get drunk and run through a schoolyard recklessly killing up children, uh, this is inhumane and you don't have the right to do it, same thing applies to these representatives who say they have, oh, we don't have a choice. All we have is to cut the budget, austerity, to kill people. They don't have the right to put those That's types of policies right. up uh, front, uh, it put those types of policies forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I was just thinking, you know, it's what we've been taking to the state legislatures is that idea that it's not the budget crisis, but it's a revenue crisis in the, in the fact that, uh, you know, the housing bubble, which really was not about house construction, but it was to fuel the speculative financial bubble around the mortgage-backed securities and, and so forth. And that once that blew, now you have these states in these crises, but the way to get the revenues back up is, or the what you have to do is get the revenues back up, not be cutting mm -hmm. the budgets. And one thing that struck me that LaRouche had said is that he, he referred to the Glass-Steagall principle 
and then he said in the same breath, or alternately, the Nawapa principle. Mm -hmm. And in one sense, what you're dealing with with Nawapa, because, you know, just Glass-Steagall alone or the bailouts of the states, you know, are, are not going to solve the crisis. The real crisis is, an, well, one, a crisis in thinking about economics, uh, but the idea of the Glass-Steagall principle or alternately the Nawapa principle is that you're extending the kind of the, the credit policy for the development of the future uh, and you're doing it with the proper sense of profit being what you can do to raise the to, to be leap, leaping to the next platform of, of development and, and allowing for this continual process of development which is really the only true notion of profit. Profits are not financial values. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes from Roosevelt is he said that uh, you spend money to save money. And well, it's kind of a simple premise, the idea being that if you don't invest and have a long-term outlook for your population, something like Nawapa, then you're not going to end up, you're gonna, the cost of losing a whole generation, as we're seeing right now, the collapse of this, this 12 to 22-year-old or whatever this grouping is that plays video games all day and mm -hmm. totally nutty and wacky, this whole, this whole generation being lost, that's a price that we can't afford not to, we can't afford to pay that price of losing our civilization as a result of losing the generation. So I think we're going to go in there and we're going to tell these people in these state legislatures, we're going to find the good ones, the ones who don't want to kill people, who say we're not going to cut Medi-Cal and cut Medicaid to destroy your life. And we're going to say, look, we want you to find something in yourself that's going to allow you and your constituents to survive this crisis. Yeah. And we know we can do it. And we want to do it this month in January. We want to make sure no one else loses a kidney transplant. Nobody else is forced to be murdered by this system. And we can achieve a victory in the month of January to totally transform what people think is possible and take this young generation and turn them into put them in a, cease, a civilian conservation corps and turn them into something worthwhile, get them to build something, maybe send them out to, uh, to Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> I exactly. think part of it is we have to get our, our national identity back. I mean, it is actually absurd as Americans to be having a discussion about who should be killed. I mean, that is sick. That is not the reason we created our republic. And if you think about Nawapa or you think about what happened at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition after the Civil War, and people knew the country had been devastated and 600,000 Americans had died, mm. but we were building or the Transcontinental Railroad, and people came to the United States and were astounded by the standard of living that the average worker had indoor plumbing. Yes. Right, which I don't know if the royalty had that, but it, it was, we were the leader of the world. And from our transcontinental railroad, then people thought of the Trans-Siberian Railroad and the Berlin to Baghdad Railroad, and it, we were the inspiration and the driver of what happened on the planet. And the same thing with the space program, right? right? It was a national mission, but, you know, the reports of the astronauts traveling to Africa and meeting people in those countries and people said it's so great that we did this as mankind mm. we did this mm. and so you think about what it means if we um, get this Nawapa launched there's not going to be any corner of the planet that has to remain in poverty and starvation without clean drinking water that we will resume our rightful leadership role as the United States and that's a, a very crucial point, the fact that this is really a global fight right now. That although much of what we're discussing is, you know, survival for the United States and the states, because, you know, this is happening here. People are, are being killed, you know, for the sake of gambling debts. But at the same time, this is a global fight. And so that's a really good point to bring up, the fact that what's happening in Europe, what's happening in Ireland, these countries should be sovereign nation states as well. And that once we make these decisions in the United States to say we're going with Glass-Steagall, we're not paying back this debt, that is the decision, this, the decision which wipes out the British Empire mm -hmm. and their power once and for all. And we can actually set up a global system of cooperation, you know, as Summer represents in California, uh, a global co-op, you know, idea of really fulfilling FDR's intention post-World War II, bring back the era of, of sovereign development of nations, and then go to Mars, finish off Kennedy's policy.
Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That's it. And uh, it's interesting because just in the past election, uh, when Summer, Rachel, and myself ran, we ran on that very concept and idea. And now we have our three friends joining us. Um, and I ran in the state of Texas in the 22nd Congressional District, where you have, uh, in the district where NASA's Johnson Space Center resides. And I mean, the mission of John, John F. Kennedy and our uh, moon landing has been completely tossed out the window. And this idea of really having not only a mission orientation for the United States and unifying those uh, patriots of the United States and the citizens um, here, but also throughout the world, as you just said, um, was the most important thing we could have ever done with the Transcontinental Railway System, with the Tennessee Valley Authority, with the moon landing program. And this is what we're bringing together right now. Uh, and you look at how insane it is that uh, while we're fighting over budget cuts and uh, who's going to be killed when and where, it's insane that we have lost sight of that principle of really having an outlook for what the world is going to look like for the next 20 uh, years, the next two or three generations down the line. And this is what the space program represented. And if you think about NAWAPA, it really has that characteristic of, you know, taking yourself outside of the, the domain of uh, the earth, surface of Earth and looking down maybe uh, 50 years from now on what the Earth looks like after the development of NAWAPA and looking down from on uh, the colony on the moon or on Mars. <laughs> And you think of how beautiful a perspective that is because you have an idea that we are building something for many, many generations to come. This is not about just putting shovels in people's hands so they can have a job right now, feel good about themselves, and have a little extra money in their pocket. But this is about making people understand what it means to be human, as Bill brought out before. And this is what the principle of uh, Glass-Steagall, what Nawapa, and what the ideas of a credit system would represent. So I, I think we are in a, a great place to be in, in terms of our challenge to the world uh, to take up this, this mission. And it is absolutely essential for especially the youth generation who have been tossed into the scrap heap of society of uh, complete degeneracy and like Mr. LaRue said, unless we change the conditions, you're going to have more young people who are faced with the same psychotic uh, insanity and environment as the guy um, Lofner in the situation in Arizona. Uh, because this is a wake-up call <laughs> to the American people uh, that we should get our act together and we need people who are going to, to really stand up and firmly and say enough is enough. Absolutely. And I think one thing to add to that is one day maybe our great grandkids who will also be running for Congress will be <laughs> having a similar type of meeting of minds on Mars. <laughs> That's great. I don't think we can go too much bigger than that. <laughs> well, we maybe we should. Well, yeah, once we get to Mars, then we can discuss the next solar system. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Ready to go. Well, with that, I think we have really laid out um, here today what we want to take back to each and every one of our regions, and what each of our candidates rep candidacies represent as not only candidacies representing. Uh, single regions of the country and districts, but we are the voice of leadership for the entire world and for that principle on which our nation was founded, the idea of a republic. And we are going to fight with everything that we have to defend that and those principles in, outlined in our Constitution. And so with that, we will close out our discussion for today and thank you all for watching us. <laughs>